Hello, everyone. People are still logging on, but we have a lot to get through. And if you're anything like me, you have a busy day. So we should get started and uh, provide you the information you came for. I am Eric Lufer, the president of the Citizens Research Council of Michigan. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our analysis of the governor's fiscal year 2025 budget recommendations. Bob, if you could bump to the next slide. Uh, many of you I know are familiar with the Citizens Research Council, but for anyone that's new to uh, our, uh, our webinars, our information, we are a 108 year old organization that was created uh, with the same mission that we have now to provide independent, nonpartisan, fact-based research for policymakers. In the case that we're dealing with, it's uh, the state legislature and people interested in the state budget, but city council, county commission, school boards, and you, the people who ultimately elect those representatives and sometimes vote on initiatives and referendum. This is, uh, our 108th year, as I said, and this is a longevity that we attribute to our really strict adherence to sound public policy, fact-based research. Uh, we are the most trusted voice for public policy analysis in the state. We rely on charitable contributions of foundations, businesses, corporations, and individuals so I'd like to encourage you to join our circle of supporters and help us to continue to provide high quality independent information on the issues affecting Michigan. Uh, additionally, we have uh, an email that goes out once a week and lets you know when there's new reports. I encourage you to put your name on that list and join our circle of uh, our, our community um, tracking what we do and consuming our reports. We're gonna be joined at the end by two representatives from Mears, uh, Carol Mellon, who is the uh, regular appearance on Off the Record, and Samantha Schreiber, who will be here at the end to ask questions and follow up on what they heard from Craig and Bob. Um, I wanna let you know that there's a handout, I think, we go to the next slide. Uh, if you want to print that real quick and follow along, take notes on that, you can go to our event page on our website and you'll see the link right on top to download the slide deck. We are recording this webinar and it will be posted on our webpage, will be available for future viewing. So if you know people who wanted to view it and were busy during this hour, uh, you let them know they can come back to this same event page and it'll be loaded there as well as on our YouTube channel. Uh, we have received some questions as part of the registration process and those have been fed to Bob and Craig to uh, try to answer them during the uh, presentation. If at the end you do have questions that were not addressed either during the presentation or in, uh, in Kyle and Samantha's questions being posed, please uh, send us an email or, or type it into the question session here and we will follow up after the uh, event trying to answer your questions. If you have any technical questions during the webinar, you can let me know. I'm at 734-542-8001. Uh, so the next slide, let me introduce Bob Schneider, he's our senior research associate uh, for state affairs. He's been with us in two different stints. This is a second session with the research council. He also has experience with the state budget office and the house fiscal agency, expert on the state budget, human services, corrections, transportation. And he's going to hand it off for a short period to Craig Thiel. And Craig is our research director, our expert on school finance. He has been with us also in two stints, but uh, has a prior experience as well with the House and Senate fiscal agencies and with the State Secretary of State's office. 
uh, as I said, his expertise in state budget, taxation, the uh, education, finance, transportation, intergovernmental relations. So let me just use that as our introduction and get out of the way. I'm going to turn this over to Bob and take it away. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Eric, uh, and welcome, everyone. Uh, happy to have you uh, joining us today. Uh, hope we can be helpful in kind of giving you a, a, a high-level overview of what uh, Governor Whitmer just proposed last week in her budget recommendation, um, and uh, happy to be taking questions uh, with our partners from MERS after uh, after the presentation is over. Uh, we thank them for being uh, being with us again this year. Uh, just I'm going to start out with kind of the big picture of you know, before the governor released her budget recommendation, the revenue picture uh, that was facing here. What uh, what choices and what options? How much room in the budget was there for, for additional growth? Um, and and how did things look? Uh, and we're going to do that for the states. The state has two, as, as some of you probably know, the state has two major revenue funds, general fund, general purpose revenue, our, our large discretionary pot of revenue, and the state school aid fund, which is primarily dedicated to K-12 schools. Also, uh, some of that comes off to uh, community colleges and universities and higher education. Uh, so let's look at those revenue estimates. Every January and May, state economists gather to, to do revenue forecasts uh, and revisions of those forecasts for the general fund uh, and, and the school aid fund. Uh, this January, uh, about a you know, month ago, uh, those, revenues, uh, re those revenue estimates were revised and they were upward, but it was a fairly modest revision upward um, between 0.6% uh, and about you know, 2, 2.5 to 3%. Um, across 23 fiscal year 23, 24, 25, the real um, the real big increase and in, and in one I think we kind of knew was coming, but that showed up in this forecast was in fiscal year 26, a healthier almost a four percent increase. And note that it's important to note that really is all uh, uh, all derived from uh, the 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 general the return to the general fund of 550 million dollars that's now coming back in 20 in fiscal year 26 to the general fund from what was if you remember in last year's budget a three year redirection of corporate income tax revenue uh 550 million dollars 500 to, to uh the soar fund um 50 million dollars to a uh revitalization and placemaking fund, those go away in 26, so we get that, that revenue back uh, in, that, in that out year. Uh, so given those forecasts, what does the situation look like for the governor going into her budget recommendation? Um, in, in short, um, we, we see room for about $650 million in, in budget growth, whether that's new spending or additional tax relief, about $650 million in room to grow the budget. That's about 4%, uh, that, I'm sorry, it's about 5% of last year's general fund. That's, that's fairly healthy. Um, and just to explain this, this chart, that blue line there are those revenue estimates from fiscal year 23 to 26 that we just saw on the previous slide. That, that red dotted line basically represents a continuation budget. How much would we need to spend in fiscal year 25 just to keep that 24 budget in place, carrying in all the ongoing funding from last year? So if we look at the difference, then it gives you uh, an idea of the room there is for growth in the budget. Um, and this year it's, it's roughly 5% growth on the general fund side. Significantly in that last bullet there, last year that, that gap was enormous. It was $2.5 billion. So this year gap is healthy, but it's nowhere near what we saw last year and smaller than what we've seen the, the last couple of years. Um, on the school aid side, I think the short, uh, the, the short version of this slide is the forecasters hit it almost on the head on the general fund side. We have very modest upward adjustments in the general uh, fund forecasted revenue, up less than one percent each year. Uh, so very little, uh, very little adjustments. What does that mean for the school aid fund? Um, then we we see about a five hundred and fifty million dollar uh, ongoing surplus. So a uh, uh, room for 
$550 million or about 3% ongoing growth can be supported with, with those projected revenues. Again, that's less than half of what we saw um, in last year's, uh, when we gave the webinar last year, that gap was about $1.3 billion. Those, both those numbers, general fund and school aid fund, were fairly unprecedented. Those were very large uh, ongoing gaps between revenue and what was being carried in from the prior year. So general fund, um, pretty healthy, you know, about 5% growth is available. School aid fund, a little less, 3% uh, is available. One very important note is the very large fund balances that we have seen in both the general fund and the school aid fund are much smaller than they have been in, in prior years. Um, you see this graph, it shows the combined year end balance for both the general fund, general purpose revenues and school aid fund over the last roughly 10 years. And you'll notice, of course, in fiscal year 2022, um, we closed that fiscal year with a tw over a $12 billion um, fund balance across those two major funds. Uh, that has shrunk significantly so based on our uh, what's appro appropriated in 24 and our best estimates of revenue um, we would expect to close this current fiscal year that, that ends in September with about a little over a billion dollars in the general fund and a little over half billion dollars in the school aid fund um, you know again much smaller than a couple years ago but then if you go look at those earlier years fiscal year 15 16 17 18 it's still uh, slightly higher than, than, than the norm um, before uh, we saw the enormous boom in in revenue and growth in these fund balances uh, post covid and then again we we throw this slide in each year um, just to add perspective at least on the general fund side um, you know, we know the state had a very challenging uh, decade between two th fiscal year 2000 and 2010. We've slowly grown out of that. So this, this chart shows orange line is actual general fund revenue. Um, blue line is the inflation ad adjusted general fund revenue using uh, fiscal year based Detroit CPI data. Um, and, and you'll know even with about 15 years now of forecasted growth, um, adjusted for inflation, that general fund revenue is still down about 24% from, from where we were at in fiscal year 2000. Would have been a little higher, um, but again, some of the, the significant uh, tax relief, EITC, retirement tax, um, push, those, uh, push that orange line down, which of course also pushes uh, the blue line down in, in inflation adjusted terms. So we've had growth, real growth for 15 years, but um, have a significant way to go, uh, you know, to catch up if we, if we, you know, we, it'll be a while before we get there. So uh, with that setup of the, the revenue situation, let's take a look at the uh, highlights of the executive budget uh, that the governor released last week, um, just at a very high level. Uh, this this uh, table shows a summary of changes from fiscal year 24 to fiscal year 25, um, both in dollar terms and in percentage terms. And I, I'd make three quick notes here. In terms of the total budget, um, the fiscal year 2024 budget, uh, adjusted gross appropriations, basically all the appropriations was about $80.7 billion. And the fiscal year 25 budget as proposed by the governor in total is about $80.7 billion. So really no overall growth in the budget um, uh, when we count all sources, uh, federal general fund, school aid fund, transportation funds, all of that. Uh, all of that combined. What we do see, and, and now the, the lower half of this key is on the general fund, general purpose, and school aid fund financed appropriations, we do see a very significant shift in the uh, in the type of appropriations being um, the ongoing and one-time nature of the appropriations. Uh, if we look at the general fund, ongoing appropriations, those intended to be permanent, a permanent part of the budget, um, grew from 12.8 billion in fiscal year 24 to 13.6 billion, almost 7% growth. On the other side, we saw 72% cut in 
in what was a, a very large one-time appropriation uh, in, in fiscal year 24, that's down to a little under $700 million. Same story on the school aid fund side, uh, ongoing appra uh, appropriations from the school aid fund up about 2.6%. Um, so the, the ongoing portion of the budget in both the general fund and the school aid fund are up. Those one-time appropriations um, down really significantly, school aid, aid fund down almost 57%. Um, so you see a, a significant change in the in the uh, the the, the uh, makeup of these appropriations, a shift from from one time uh, uh, appropriations, which of course drew on those very large fund balances, and it, it, more of the budget is now ongoing uh, in in nature. And before uh, before I shoot it over to Craig, uh, one last slide. Um, to pr put some perspective on the recent budget growth that we have seen, um, this this graph here looks at total, again, that total state budget, total adjusted gross appropriations from all sources. Um, and, and, uh, and, and what we do here is adjust those appropriations for inflation. So the, these each of these bars uh, going back in time is expressed in fiscal year 2024 dollars. So uh, the the uh, the growth in this is real growth uh, above and beyond inflation. We get asked all the time, what's driving the enormous growth we've seen? The fisc if you look in actual dollars, not inflation adjusted, the fiscal year 19 budget, the total budget was 58 billion dollars. By fiscal year 23, it was 85 billion dollars. By anybody's uh, measure, that's a very large. Uh, growth in the budget over four years, uh, but when we when we adjust those for inflation, we see something very interesting. And and quite frankly, I was I was even a little surprised at how how this this chart worked out. Um, what we did was that that dotted red line shows the long run trend prior to COVID between 2010 and 2019. You'll see it's very consistent. We had slow real growth in in the state budget. COVID hits and we have a massive spike well above that trend line. Um, and largely that's due, you see those big blue areas, which is federal funding, largely do this huge influx of federal revenue um, as, as well as one-time spending out of state fund balances that occurred over that period. So we're well over that trend in fiscal year 20, 21, 22, 23. Start coming down in 24, and then we get to this, this proposed budget by the governor, and, and quite frankly, we're right back at that trend. Um, the proposed budget really returns to that pre-COVID trend, despite the fact that in dollars, actual dollars, it's much bigger. The dollar adjustment from the, the pre-COVID trend to now largely is due to inflation. Um, you can, uh, so if you had asked me back in 2019 to forecast uh, what this budget would look like in terms of the total adjusted gross, and you let me know that, hey, inflation's gonna be pretty high, it's gonna hit 6%, 8% in a couple of these years, it wouldn't surprise me that, that, we're, uh, that we're at the point that we're at right now. And I think the, the key takeaway from this slide is we have pretty much weaned off of that um, really high level of, of both one-time spending from federal and state funds, and we're back to um, kind of a more normal trend now um, going forward. So uh, with that as an introduction, I am going to uh, turn the mic over to Craig Thiel, and he's gonna talk a little bit about some of the highlights uh, in K-12 and education portions of the budget. Hey, thank you, Bob. Appreciate that uh, set up. Uh, let me follow up with a, a little more uh, of uh, context, at least for understanding the K-12 uh, education pieces of this budget. Uh, I think it's important to, um, in understanding the the component pieces, to kind of take a step back and and look at you know how our kids in K through 12 schools are doing. And, and you know, an honest assessment would be that there's some serious challenges there, um, wh whether or not we're looking at fourth grade reading, uh, eighth grade math, whether or not we're looking at um, student performance over time or relative to other states. Michigan kids, uh, public school students are, 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 are challenged uh, across a number of measures. And, and uh, these challenges are, are 
made worse uh, for, for a number of our uh, low income students across the state. Um, so when we think about looking at the, the budget and the component pieces, when we think about uh, addressing early learning, reading, uh, we can see why there's investments in early literacy um, and, and why the budget's shaped the way it is. It's also important to, to realize that the pandemic, while it's in the rearview mirror for a lot of us and we've gotten on with our lives, uh, there have been some serious negative impacts to uh, learning and achievement across uh, schools. And a lot of that uh, catch-up learning uh, hasn't been completed yet. Um, and, and so this budget attempts to, to deal with that, uh, those challenges as well. And then the pandemic obviously brought about a, a, an, an increased wave of challenges for student mental health um, as isolation, uh, closed schools, uh, all of the uh, challenges that uh, kids dealt with uh, through the pandemic are, are still present today. Um, picking up on Bob's point, uh, this budget really is a return to normal, at least with respect to revenue growth for the school aid fund. Uh, we see the uh, uh, revenue uh, kind of reverting back to trend. Uh, we, also, as Bob mentioned, our large surpluses will largely be exhausted by the end of this budget. There are some uh, of these resources being programmed for the 2025 budget, but by the end of that year, uh, you'll see uh, those those have been exhausted. Um, the federal government stepped in during the pandemic with a massive amount of uh, resources for K-12 students. Um, uh, in this most recent fiscal year, uh, the ESSER funding, the, the federal uh, discretionary funds that went directly to school districts amounted to about 7% of the total general fund spending in 2023 uh, as those dollars expire in December, they're going to create some funding cliffs for school districts. And this budget really isn't in a, in a position to, to backfill those resources. And that's an important point to keep in mind. And then as we look at the governor's proposal here, clearly um, she's in her second term. She's uh, building on her previous uh, budget priorities. Two stand out to me. One is the development and implementation of a, a universal pre-K, so that would be uh, uh, early childhood preschool uh, programming through 14, that's uh, the two years of community college. Uh, this budget is looking to expand access to uh, publicly funded pre-K programs um, by removing uh, the income eligibility, and then as well uh, providing student scholarships to community college uh, to uh, complete that pre-K through 14 uh, program that she's looking to implement. And then the other uh, emphasis that this governor has been focused on providing uh, different amounts of funding based on student needs, uh, whether it's at-risk students, special ed, or early learner, or English learners. Can I get a... Oh, there we go. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, as we look at the the appropriations for K through 12, this 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 chart really echoes what Bob was saying about the the shift in what we're seeing in, of appropriations. Uh, ongoing appropriations are presented in the blue, large blue bar. Uh, the one-time appropriations at that top piece for uh, K. K-12. This is all funds, so this is the school aid fund as well as the federal funds that flow into K through 12. And if you look back to the the large increase between 23 and 24, ongoing funding was up almost nine percent. In this budget proposal we have before us, its total fund increase is about three um, uh, percent in terms of ongoing resources. When you fold in those one-time resources, you can see for the current year budget, about $2.6 billion is, is being distributed in, in what's considered one-time appropriation. That's down uh, more than 60% uh, down to uh, just under a billion dollars. So when we think about the total K-12 through budget across all appropriation types, the total 
funding uh, next year under this budget would, would decline by about 4%. And again, most of that, uh, almost all of that decline is attributable to the one-time one resources that are pulled out in the 25 budget. Um, this chart looks at the surpluses in the school aid fund um, that the state has had it at its disposal. I'll point you back to the 2022 fiscal year when total uh, uh, budget surplus at the end of 2022 was 4.5 billion. And uh, each of the next two fiscal years, you can see those surpluses uh, de declining as they're programmed into uh, spending uh, uh, items uh, for K through 12 schools uh, across both the ongoing spending as well as uh, one-time appropriations. By the time, uh, if this budget were to be adopted um, as is, um, House and Senate fiscal agencies uh, as well as the state budget office uh, are reflecting about uh, $12 million on the uh, school aid fund uh, balance sheet at the end of uh, 2025. So uh, clearly uh, a return to normal when we think about uh, funding for K through 12 spending. Um, this slide uh, here represents kind of a, uh, an outgrowth of uh, those very large uh, budget surpluses in 2022 and 2023. Uh, what the state did was uh, take um, about $3 billion of the uh, one-time uh, resources that were available and uh, allocated them to some K through 12 reserve funds. Uh, uh, I've got uh, three here um, uh, identified. Uh, there's a new rainy day fund was created for uh, K through 12 schools, if uh, economy sours and revenues start to decline and uh, school funding uh, needs to be cut, uh, there's a trigger in state law to, to tap into this $450 million. Um, the state looking at the challenges that uh, communities face in raising dollars for school infrastructure, created a school infrastructure reserve fund, almost $500 million. Uh, some of that money has been appropriated so far, but there's large um, amounts of that uh, on the sidelines and still available. And then recognizing that we've been in a, a long-term period of uh, declining enrollment, um, the state set some dollars aside to help mitigate the fiscal effects to school districts from declining enrollment. Um, some of these reserve funds have been appropriated in the last couple fiscal years. Here, I, I'm, I'm showing uh, about 166 million was appropriated in the 23 fiscal year, uh, then about 700 uh, million uh, the current year. Uh, the budget, the governor's budget, recommends another 300 uh, million, uh, 328 million to be appropriated across these various reserve funds. Uh, again, if this proposal is enacted as is it would leave about $1.7 billion still in reserve uh, and available for future spending. Uh, and I'd note that this 1.7 is in addition to the school aid fund, uh, the general school aid fund balances I talked about. So diving into the ongoing appropriations as, as the budget kind of gets back to a, a normal uh, status, um, this chart uh, presents uh, ongoing uh, appropriations specifically from the school aid fund. So this factors out uh, funding uh, federal resources, uh, other small amounts of state restricted resources that are, are, are funding uh, schools. This is just focusing on our, our state school aid fund and it's uh, looking at uh, only ongoing appropriations, factoring out those one-time appropriations for K through 12 as well as the uh, higher ed um, sector. And what we can see here is that, uh, you know, as Bob pointed out, uh, base school aid fund spending is up about inflation, about 2.6% uh, year over year. Um, and, you know, that's an inflationary increase that most people would say is, is kind of consistent with the revenue growth. Um, but then when we peel back the budget and 
look from the inside of the budget out as opposed to looking from the outside in and see this 2.6%, we see a number of uh, new spending initiatives, uh, expansions of programs uh, being funded. And um, the story there is what you see in these uh, amounts I've, I've identified as increases in ongoing funding and decreases in ongoing funding. Ongoing funding items are gonna go up by about a billion dollars uh, year over year. Um, and, and those increases are largely being funded uh, as a result of a change in law that the governor is proposing that would redirect about in the K through 12 uh, budget about $632 million that's currently dedicated to uh, funding of uh, school employee retiree health obligations. Um, and I'm gonna talk about that in a couple slides here. So really uh, the, the complexion of the budget looks much different um, when you uh, kind of look from the inside out as opposed to the outside in, because there are a lot of uh, increases, uh, new programs that are being funded, primarily uh, contingent on this uh, change in law that the governor has proposed. The higher education budget, I'd note um, there's uh, community colleges will continue to be funded from the 100% uh, from the school aid fund. They're getting a 2.5% uh, operational increase in their appropriation. Uh, universities, the uh, uh, amount of funding from the school aid fund on an ongoing basis dedicated to universities is going to increase by about $100 million to uh, offset uh, general fund appropriations for the public uni universities. So if we look year over year, uh, higher education is actually gonna see uh, a, a larger percentage increase in the school aid fund uh, uh, allocation. A good portion of this is also tied to this change in state law uh, freeing up um, some of the pension contributions. So let's get into that. Uh, I know, uh, uh, pension funding uh, can get down in the weeds quick. I'm, I'm gonna try to keep it as high level as I can. Um, state school employees are uh, covered by the Michigan Public School Employees Retirement System. This is a state run system. Um, there's two components here. There's a pension component and then there's a retiree health component. Uh, the pension component as of the end of the 22 uh, fiscal year, which is the last time we, we've uh, evaluated the system, had about 35 billion in unfunded liabilities. So uh, basically the system uh, was short. Um, if, if all bills came due uh, at the end of 2022, the system would have been short about 35 billion. Fortunately, uh, the pension plan is on schedule uh, and those liabilities to be uh, fully funded by 2038. Um, so there is a plan in place to bring that 64% funded ratio up to 100% uh, by 2038. The retiree health was on a same uh, 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 payoff plan uh, for a number of years, um, but state law, uh, uh, changed and required a more rapid payoff of the retiree health. Um, and so uh, the budget recognizes that these li liabilities are likely to be fully funded, 100% funded by the 2025 fiscal year. And therefore the amortization payment, basically the debt service payment on those liabilities won't be needed. And the, the governor is uh, requesting a statutory change to the funding floor provision of the uh, school retire, retiree um, act to free up these fundings, uh, free up this funding to allow uh, her to tap into these resources, uh, not the pension component, but the, uh, the funding that's currently going to retiree health. The, the funding floor basically says that the amount that's funded uh, in the previous year needs to be continued to be funded in the next year. So uh, uh, until those uh, uh, liabilities are uh, all the way paid off, and that's expected to be in the uh, 2025 fiscal year. So the governor is asking to free up uh, these resources by uh, 
modifying the floor provision. Um, the budget impact here, as we can see, uh, across uh, the community colleges as well as K through 12, it'll it'll free up about 670 million dollars. Um, and then these resources are redirected as savings uh, uh, to other areas of the budget. Um, you know, uh, both program expansions, uh, uh, new programs, converting uh, existing one-time programs into ongoing resources. This 670 million goes quite a ways in supporting uh, new uh, spending for the 2025 uh, fiscal year. I would point point out also that the the budget proposal doesn't make any change to the employer's contribution for uh, pension retiree health. The the cap of 20.96 percent remains in state law, so there wouldn't be a a change. However, the governor is recommending that some of the savings from the uh, 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 law change would would flow to the employer contribution and re reduce that by almost a percentage point. Um, the governor isn't recommending any change to the employee contribution uh, required for retiree health either. So uh, the, the the savings from this uh, proposed change would be reflected all at the state level. So real quickly, uh, going through some of the 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 individual components of this budget uh, recommendation, the foundation allowance, uh, again, which is the primary funding source for school operations. The governor's recommending a, a inflationary increase of about uh, $241 per pupil. Um, notably, uh, the for 2025, cyber schools, those are uh, schools that uh, provide learning 100% online they would receive 80% uh, uh, of the base foundation allotment. That would be just under uh, $7,900. Uh, I'd note that um, the 16 cyber schools uh, didn't receive any increase in their foundation grant um, in, in 2024. They were funded at $9,150. So uh, this reduction uh, would represent a, a, a a clear cut to the programming dollars that they have available. Um, K through 12 funding is largely uh, uh, determined by the number of students that are enrolled in an individual district. Statewide, uh, we've seen uh, a long-term slide in public school enrollments, and that's projected to continue in 2025, uh, about a half a percentage point, and again in 2026. To address this concern, the budget includes a uh, continuation of a, a $71 million appropriation to provide some relief from the fiscal effects of declining enrollment. If we look at uh, funding for specific student uh, groups, uh, at-risk funding uh, is increased by 2.5%, again, relying on the uh, new opportunity index uh, uh, formula to distribute these dollars. Uh, this index is designed to provide uh, greater per pupil amounts to those districts that have higher concentrations of poverty. Um, uh, currently, uh, the target is to fund all districts at 35% of the foundation allowance. That's happening. Um, uh, that I should say that's not happening right now. As a result, these payments are currently prorated, but uh, districts are receiving uh, at least 11% uh, of the foundation allowance through an at-risk uh, allocation. Special ed education students will receive the full uh, uh, foundation allowance plus the required Headley percentages. So this is the uh, additional resources uh, to help uh, meet the costs that local districts incur providing those services. The budget includes a, a new $124 million grant to equalize uh, the revenue raising capacity of uh, local districts for special ed. Uh, special ed is uh, funded uh, at, at the county level, uh, ISD level uh, through a millage. Uh, this new uh, categorical grant would help uh, equalize uh, uh, the revenue raising across the state for those uh, services. English language learners, uh, 
this uh, categorical uh, item would increase by 7.5%, so uh, more than inflation, uh, uh, as well as funding for the isolated districts, districts that have a large geographic uh, footprints, very few students, costs in, in those communities are uh, for delivering services are higher, so the governor's recognizing that and increasing the the student weights uh, in each the ELL and isolated district funding. The governor has proposed um, to address uh, funding needs of students uh, that are in deep poverty. Uh, a new $90 million competitive grant uh, is being proposed to uh, go to meet the academic, social, uh, physical needs of children uh, who receive food stamps, cash assistance. There's about uh, 375,000 kids in the state who currently qualify for food stamps. Uh, these students uh, are uh, receiving the at-risk funding. So this would be uh, an additional uh, funding item uh, available to districts to meet the needs of these students. Uh, I would note that the um, the funds won't be distributed on a per pupil basis, but they'll be distributed to dis districts on a grant basis. Uh, and then uh, another major proposal is uh, the governor's plan to open up uh, universal pre-K. The goal is to enroll 75% of Michigan four-year-olds in a publicly funded preschool. Currently about 40% of uh, four-year-olds are enrolled in some form of public preschool. Um, to, to hit the governor's uh, plan of 75% will require another 40,000 uh, kids to be enrolled in, in public preschool. Um, current programs have capacity to enroll uh, about 6,800 of these, these children. So the governor's budget uh, provides funding to open up those slots, $64 million for existing providers, and then increases the per pupil allocation for these uh, uh, slots. Uh, instead of a 5% increase, uh, we're, we're gonna see about a 15% increase in the funding for uh, preschool slots um, uh, for the Great Start Readiness Program. And then to recognize that there's a capacity need for uh, hitting the 75% goal, uh, the governor's recommending some preschool uh, grants, $35 million to go out to help uh, open new classrooms, uh, hire new teachers here. Um, finally, looking at the one-time funding, because there is some one-time funding in this budget, uh, we've pointed out here that about 80% of these one-time resources have been previously funded. Um, some of them as one-time uh, resources in, in the current year budget, some in previous budgets. So overall, uh, while the one-time funding is down considerably, uh, uh, a number of these items have kind of become somewhat uh, ongoing in nature, and we'll be uh, tracking those as we move through the budget. So before I turn it over to Bob, I just want to just hit two big takeaways, in my opinion, on, the, on this budget proposal. Um, when we look at the kind of the base funding initiative uh, in, the, in this budget, uh, the foundation allowance, at-risk, special ed, it's an inflationary increase. Um, those are resources that are supported by the increase in the ongoing school aid fund dollars that are projected uh, for 2025. Uh, but in addition to that, uh, those funding increase for base, base items, uh, a number of items will benefit from this change in the pension funding floor, which will free up about $632 million on a full year basis for other items. Uh, I talked about the preschool funding. I talked about some of the one-time items. All of these uh, items would be funded in part from the resources that are uh, freed up from uh, the law change. Uh, the governor's budget is premised on a full year uh, implementation of this law change. If for some reason that the, the changes don't take effect until uh, sometime into the 2025 fiscal year, those, those savings will be reduced. So with that, I wanna turn it back over to Bob who will uh, run you through the general fund budget. 
Thank you, Craig. And my screen is on. Is that okay? Great. So we're uh, I, uh, w w we'll wrap it up by looking at some highlights of uh, of the general budget. Um, and I'm going to start with uh, a little similar to what Craig did. Uh, kind of take a look at the impact of changes in one-time funding over time uh, for the general fund general purpose budget. Just as Craig showed with school aid fund, um, we we had very significant amounts of general fund over the last several years appropriated on a one-time basis. Um, so the blue bar, the blue uh, uh, components of the bars here are ongoing funding, and the the orange uh, the orange sections are funds that were designated as one time. So and, and again, you'll see the the that this 25 budget as proposed by the governor um, is much more ongoing than 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 those previous budgets. If you look at the 24 uh, general fund budget. Uh, it was $15.6 billion in total. It's down in 25 to $14.3 billion, but that ongoing component goes up from, from 12.8 to 13.7. And, and just as Craig noted with the school aid fund, those large one-time funding allocations, which are both, um, you know, they, they, they reflect both one-time allocations in the original budget and supplemental allocations that occurred after the budget was passed. Those will, under current estimates, if this budget is passed uh, as um, uh, as the governor proposed it and revenue projections hold, will eliminate the remaining general fund uh, uh, fund balance by the end of fiscal year 25. Some highlights uh, in certain areas of, of the of the uh, other areas of the budget. Um, TANF dollars, the state uh, gets $772 uh, million each year from the federal government and a temporary assistance for needy families block grant. Uh, and th this comes out of welfare reform back from the in the 1990s. Um, back in the 1990s, um, this block grant was primarily, not exclusively, primarily used to support um, cash assistance and other social welfare assistance to, to low-income families. Over time, that has changed pretty dramatically in Michigan and, and in most places nationally. Um, that chart right there, uh, for instance, show, uh, that's on this slide, shows the percent of that federal TANF that's spent on basic um, traditional cash assistance for low-income families. It excludes uh, child welfare-related assistance, but basic assistance to, to low-income families. You'll see Michigan way over on the right side of that. We only spend uh, between five and six percent of our TANF, uh, our TANF allocation on, on that type of assistance. The U.S. average is close to 40 percent. So for the first time in many, many years, this budget proposes to um, reshuffle TANF, $167 million that's currently spent on scholarship programs and DHHS uh, admin costs will be replaced. The, the TANF gets replaced with general fund, and then that TANF is redirected to allow enhancements in more traditional uses, social welfare uses of that. That includes $64 million for child care enhancements, um, 45 between those next two bullets for, for uh, low-income cash assistance, including a special earmark for young, uh, increase in an earmark for young children, um, $30 million for emergency crisis assistance, $24 million for, for prenatal and infant support program. Um, the first real major, and I, I should call this a first step, we are certainly, that's not gonna move us too far to the left on, on that chart, but it'll move us a little bit to the left, and it's uh, the first real allocation uh, to those traditional social welfare uses in in uh, in quite some time in quite some time excuse me um, the budget uh, on this slide we show the budget continues an emphasis on student financial aid programs um, the uh, particularly on the chart you'll see the purple the new purple bar initiated in fiscal year 23 is the uh, Michigan Achievement Scholarships. The governor's 25 budget adds another $30 million for, for, that, uh, for that scholarship allocation. Um, and, in, and in particular, 
Um, the governor is proposing an, an enhancement to the purpose of that money, um, providing a community college guarantee, which basically would mean that the, the achievement scholarships would be used as sort of na uh, last dollar coverage for, to cover tuition costs um, for future Michigan high school graduates uh, at, uh, you know, for, for two years of um, uh, 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 eligible uh, community college, uh, you know, in, 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 uh, in demand kind of uh, uh, fields, which would be, uh, would be most of the community college work that people would do. On top of that, it's another thousand dollars would be offered for uh, for income eligible students, this would be for everybody, but folks with uh, with lower incomes for other types of costs, housing, room and board, books, you know, supplies and so forth. Um, so that's a uh, more money for the achievement scholarships, plus that additional um, that additional coverage for those. Twenty million dollars is added for the uh, the tuition incentive program for low income Medicaid eligible students. Um, significantly on the other end there is a phase there there's a continued phase out of uh some other scholarship programs which will uh the state competitive scholarships michigan tuition grants will be phased out the achievement scholarships will basically uh become the main source of of state-based financial aid on, uh, for local governments, I think the major uh, the major change is, as it is most years, is local revenue sharing. Um, again, the state has uh, constitutionally dedicated re revenue sharing from from a certain percentage of the sales tax. There's also discretionary statutory revenue sharing, and that allocation. Um, the, uh, the the statutory allocations will go up five percent on an ongoing basis to all local to units of government. That's county, cities, villages, townships, and on top of that, there would be a, there will be a five percent one-time increase equivalent to another five percent in growth. Um, Two percent of that is reserved for public safety spending. Three percent of that rec re represents a local fiscal recovery uh, fund incentive, which basically means that to get to three percent, local units will need to certify um, by December, by this December, that they will have obligated their full local fiscal recovery fund balances from the American Rescue Plan. Um, and remember, uh, just to uh, make sure we remember, those have to be, under federal law, have to be obligated by the end of the year um, and spent by uh, by 2026. So uh, local units that manage to obligate, which means I need to be under some type of contractual um, agreement and uh, obligation to spend that money will get the 3% allocation. Uh, one item that uh, that that uh, was addressed in part, but um, probably represents a long-term um, issue that the state will need to deal with still are the roads. So what, what what's in this budget for the roads? Um, we decided to maybe provide some historical context on growth in uh, in funding for uh, road uh, road construction and maintenance. So the governor's budget includes $4.7 billion across those areas, and that includes one-time uh, funding of $150 million um, in general fund to support both federal aid matching. Um, remember, the, the state is getting more money from the, the federal government. Notice that blue section for federal aid goes up significantly over these 10 years. Um, a lot of that is attributable to the new uh, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which boosted federal aid to states. Also, there's some money dedicated for local bridge and, and culvert projects. 55 million of it uh, is dedicated for, for that purpose. But if you look at that chart, uh, a lot of growth in, in overall funding from the general fund, from, uh, from our dedicated transportation revenues at the state level in orange, the blue sections, the federal funding goes up by four, uh, but goes, I'm sorry, by 83% from fiscal year 15 to 25. What's notable, however, is if you look at uh, construction inflation, and we use here not a perfect measure, but it's a a, a broadly used national measure, the not National Highway Construction Cost Index. If you look at that inflation level, it's well over 70%. So if you adjust that money for inflation, um, similar that we did with GF revenue earlier, uh, but we use this 
uh, th this construction co highway construction cost index, which reflects really significant increases, um, much more than CPI, for instance, in general inflation, much more inflation in those construction costs. Um, it eats away most of that revenue. And remember, the governor is um, uh, the, the, the final tranche of bonding, $700 million in road funding will be released. Uh, is, is coming. Uh, that will be the last iteration of a $3.5 billion bonding plan. Um, after that, um, we're going to be left with this revenue, which as of now um, has grown a lot. But again, um, really, when you adjust for uh, construction costs increases over time, we're kind of we, you know, we're kind of treading water with a very little real growth after that uh, after that inflation adjustment. And then worth noting some tax policy proposals that were included in this budget that will, um, we talked about our the, the revenue estimates. These will take a little bit away from the revenue estimates, not nearly as much as, uh, as the tax relief proposals in last year's budget, but we have $100 million uh, the estimated foregone revenue in fiscal year 26 from a research and development tax credit. And then the governor has also proposed a caregiver's tax credit, which um, down the road will eventually uh, hit uh, the estimated cost of about $37.5 billion. So uh, th those are some of the highlights uh, of, of the general budget areas. Now let's uh, we'll, we'll close with sort of a long-term budget outlook. Um, and again, I think our, our uh, our main uh, our main takeaway and what we share with you is the budget's going to look a lot more normal now than it has um, in the years of uh, big fund balances and, and big surpluses. If we were going to just redo what we did earlier um, with with the general fund, only we're going to look out now um, to fiscal year 26. That blue line is the consensus revenue estimates we talked about before, but we've adjusted them down a little bit for those uh, for those for that those tax relief proposals we just dis discussed. And then that red uh, that red dotted line, it's not the 24 continuation budget now. It's what's a what the governor has proposed in 25. How much do we need to continue that into 26? And what we see is. Uh, with current revenue estimates, with what the governor's proposed, um, the the room for growth in 26 gets uh, much more smaller and looks a lot more like an inflationary growth, about 2.3%, $320 million in room. And again, remind, uh, as we talked about earlier, that general fund uh, fund balance that, that we've enjoyed over the previous uh, several years will be near zero, um, given the one-time spending uh, in this budget drawing down the last of that. Um, similarly, on the school aid side, even a tighter budget, again, with only our ongoing revenues, um, if we incorporate what the governor has proposed for 25 and carry that into 26, only about 200 million plus a room for growth, that's only about 1%. That's, uh, uh, and as Craig noted, the school aid fund balances would also largely be eliminated by the end of uh, fiscal year 25. Craig did note, and it's important to note here, this, uh, I, I guess I'd note two things. This assumes one, that the MIPSERS uh, redirection that Craig discussed goes forward and would be continued into 26. Um, what we don't draw on here, though, is what, what Craig also noted, those significant um, fund balance, uh, those significant reserves that were appropriated. This doesn't assume any of those get used. Um, in particular, uh, we have $450 million still in the rainy day school aid reserve, but those other reserves, Craig noted, to the extent that those get drawn on, that, that would open up more room, but this still gives you... Um, uh, a picture of the tightness between ongoing regular revenue, not drawing on one-time reserves, and what we have appropriated right now. Uh, I think the good news right now in terms of rainy day fund reserves is the, the budget stabilization fund, the regular budget stabilization fund, um, has about as much provides a, as much buffer as it as it really ever has. Um, the 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 governor's budget proposal would add another hundred million to the budget stabilization fund in 25. It would bring the balance, the estimated balance, with interest added to about 2.2 billion dollars by the end of uh, by the end of fiscal year uh, 25. Those reserves would equate to over six 
4.5% of the combined general fund and school aid fund revenue. Um, that exceeds the, the peak we reached in, in fiscal year 99 before things turned really sour for Michigan and we drew down that, that, uh, that reserve balance very quickly. Um, I would note again that $450 million in school aid fund rainy day is not in here. If you added that in, you'd probably even get closer to uh, 8%, maybe a little over 8% in terms of the buffer that's provided. Um, and then we'll close with one last uh, issue and risk uh, to the budget out there. What about the income tax rate? So many of you may know, um, we, the, the income tax rate in Michigan fell from 4.25% to 4.05% uh, in tax year 2023. Um, we're, we're filing our returns right now. Um, that, was, uh, that was deemed by the Attorney General and so far has been supported by uh, a Court of Appeals ruling to be temporary. So the, as of now, uh, the income tax rate would go back up to 4.25%, but there is a, uh, a, an ongoing court uh, battle over this. And here we show the impact. What if uh, the courts in the end rule that that should be permanent? Uh, effectively, that reduces our revenue in fiscal year 24. That blue line is current revenue. Green line is uh, after with a permanent rate cut by $530 million in fiscal year 24, and then $760 million every year thereafter. Um, just in 24 and 25, that creates a, a $1.3 billion budget hole. Um, you know, we do have a $2.2 billion uh, rainy day surplus, but um, you would have to burn through that very quickly and, and not in a very responsible way to uh, to get over this hurdle. Effectively, you would need major budget revisions, um, uh, you know, to maintain uh, balance, you know, long-term structural balance in the budget. This, the, the, the budget would not be structurally balanced if that, uh, if that type of ruling uh, is handed down from the courts. So uh, that is where we're going to wrap up. We appreciate your attendance today. Um, and I'm going to send it back to Eric and we can um, uh, see if uh, we have questions from uh, Kyle and Sam or, or others on the call. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Craig. Before I hand it off to them, we have one clarifying question. Bob, could you clarify the 3% local fiscal recovery fund incentive? Yes, let me, I'll, I'll try to do that again. So the, the, there is boilerplate in the, in the fiscal 2025 budget that provides that one-time incentive funding to any local unit that is able to, in my recollection is you need to um, certify to the Department of Treasury by December of this year that you had, that, that that local unit has obligated all of its uh, American Rescue Plan local fiscal recovery fund. Uh, remember local units got, I think it was six plus billion dollars spread across all local units of government, just like the state got a very significant amount from the federal government under the American Rescue Plan. Um, federal law requires that to be obligated or, you know, uh, uh, you know, we're, we've, we, we have uh, a, uh, uh, we've obligated that for a certain purpose, which which as I read it means you need to have some type of arrangement in place to spend that money beyond just saying we, uh, we think we're gonna use it for roads or something like that. We, you have to have um, some type of formal obligation um, and if, if uh, locals certify to the, to, the, um, uh, to the Department of Treasury that they've done that, uh, then they'll, they'll get that 3%. Ho hopefully that's, uh, that's clearer. Okay, Carl and Sam, if you can unmute your microphone, the stage is yours. I cannot do it on my end. It says you're self-muted. There we go. Can you hear us now, Carl and Sam? We should hear you.
All right, can you hear me? There we go, we can hear yep. you. All right, excellent. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Um, my first question, I think is for Bob, and, and you kind of touched on this at the end, but I want to ask it more directly. Is this budget sustainable long-term? If, uh, if the revenue estimates turn out the way that, that they're projected, and, and we've been quite accurate with those uh, as, as of late, um, and we, uh, we get the Court of Appeals ruling upheld as, as that, as that uh, lawsuit goes through higher courts. And I guess I would also mention if the MIPSERS, uh, if the MIPSERS fund shift that Craig discussed uh, and the law change that's needed to do that is enacted, um, then this budget is uh, is does have long term stability. Um, we see much uh, you know more constrained growth going out, but it is uh, it is sustainable then over time. If we find out uh, that the a, a higher court, the Supreme Court, for instance, says you know what we don't agree on the income tax, we think it should stay at 4.05 percent. Now we're need going to need to rewrite the budget if. If the MIPSER shift gets rejected and you cannot pass legislation to do that, then you have an issue in at least on the school aid side um, to resolve. But other than you know, with those those issues, um, the budget is presented. We we would characterize as sustainable. Yes. Hi. Can everyone hear me? Okay. We, we can, can, Sam. Thanks. Oh, fantastic. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about in terms of funding or specific programs, what do you view as the biggest wins here for local governments in this budget proposal? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the for, for local governments on my end, and I, I assume by local governments, you mean, uh, you know, cities, villages and townships, as opposed to Craig may add on, on for school districts, which are, that are local governments uh, as well. But, you know, the, the revenue sharing increase, I, I, you know, is, is is the biggest thing I would point to for general uh, local units of government. 5% is is gonna be above inflation uh, as, as an ongoing change, at least we project that it will be. Um, and then another 5% in, in one-time funding. Um, you know, that that's a, a decent increase, but we also showed on that slide, we're still way behind um, where we were, you know, 20 years ago. Uh, on revenue sharing when you adjust that amount for inflation. So we're, we're uh, you know, it, it was a uh, reasonably healthy increase, um, but, uh, you know, uh, we're still lagging way behind where we were before the revenue sharing cuts that happened between 2000 and, you know, 2008, 2010. Um, other things, I mean, if, 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 if county uh, road commissions and local road agencies, are uh, are included in kind of local units of government. There is some there is some uh, uh, one time funding for uh, roads and bridges. There's some one time funding for public transit incentives um, that will help at the local level. Um, local courts are going to get some additional money in this budget. Um, but I think that that revenue sharing would be the highlight for for just general local units of government. Craig, I don't know if you want to add anything on the school aid side no i i did have a, a school aid question for craig now if the legislature decides not to go forward with this uh, pre-funding of school retiree fund shift um 632 million as you described um would not be available what are the most likely things then from this budget that would not be funded without that fund shift well, good question. Um, the, the budget doesn't tie the, you know, uh, MIPSERS change to any specific items. So, you know, this is just my looking at the overall proposed spending plan and, and the numbers there. Um, we can see that the kind of ongoing revenue increase that we talked about in terms of the school aid fund, going up uh, about 2.5, 2.6% year over year. 
those resources are, are sufficient to support the foundation allowance increase that's proposed here, $241 per kid, and the funding for the at-risk increase, inflationary increase, and the inflationary increases um, for the special ed program. Everything else is more or less tied to this funding shift, Kyle. So um, th that's why I said, you know, the complexion of the budget looks a lot different from the outside than from the inside. From the outside, it looks like it's an inflationary increase keeping up with the cost of, of, of uh, prices in the economy, broadly speaking. Uh, but from the inside, when this fund shift's taken into account, you know, we have uh, programs that were identified as one time only uh, in the current year that the governor recommends uh, as a ongoing uh, spending for 2025 and beyond uh, the support for that for those type of things would come from this fund ship there's a, a new uh, uh, list of one-time items that the governor would like to, to spend on uh, in this budget that would be tied to this so really um, you know the inflationary increases to the the foundation allowance, at risk, special ed could be covered by, you know, the revenue growth. The rest of it is tied to this fund shift. What about the expansion of the school lunch and breakfast program? Without this fund shift, is that possible that that could continue? It looks like they're gonna have to put a little bit more into that than, than uh, they expected. Yeah, this budget draws on um, some ongoing resources as well as some money that's been put in reserve and the school, reserve funds I talked about in my, pre my, my, my comments. Um, you know, uh, it, the, the cost of this program is estimated to be about $200 million on a full year implementation, about uh, uh, $10, $10 million more than the, the current year. Um, yes, yeah, so you know, on the margins that the expansion of that program would have to be uh, curtailed back. Obviously that would be subject to negotiation, but yes, that, that would be another item that is uh, tied to this funding shift. I want to ask about the bucks provided in the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, the Federal Congressional Infrastructure Dollars. When you think about inflation, when you think about the supply chain and supply demands, uh, do these dollars actually have a real impact or are they now just kind of mediocre federal funds? Well, I, I would say, I mean, without the dollars, we'd be in real trouble. <laughs> I mean, we'd be even further by, you know, we instead of um, kind of treading water relative to construction cost inflation, we'd be way behind. Um, uh, so they certainly have uh, have helped the state. Um, the you know a, an open question in, uh, is you know ha to what extent, for instance, has the extra federal money um, helped fuel the construction cost inflation that we've seen um, that really uh, ramped up quickly late 2020 into 20 you know 21 22 um that index that we used as our deflator um kind of skyrocketed i think there were other reasons that that happened uh, aside from um creating you know effectively more demand because states, all states are getting more money from that uh, from that enhancement and uh, and so they're able to uh, try to push out more work well that creates more demand for the work and and it's not surprising that that would also contribute to to costs going up um but uh, you know I, we know our infrastructure um, in Michigan in particular, but nationally we have challenges with, with road infrastructure and other kinds of infrastructure. Um, I wouldn't say, uh, I think in federal investments in infrastructure are, are needed and are, are wise, um, uh, but right, we have, you know, those numbers show that extra money we've gotten from IIJ for the, from the federal government, um, you know, have, the increase we've seen has been largely eaten up by, by the fact that costs have, have gone up significantly um, for, for construction, so. I now want to redirect focus to the TANF dollars because I find that quite interesting. Why do you think the state 
walked away as far as it did from providing direct cash benefits? Yeah, I, I mean, I was working in the House Fiscal Agency. Um, I worked on that human health and human services budget for uh, for a significant period of time, including when a lot of these changes were made. Um, this was right during, uh, you know, maybe at the tail end of uh, uh, the real bad uh, revenue situation that the state uh, the state was facing. Um, I think. I don't want to say it was all a budget decision and it was all a money decision, but that was certainly a, a factor uh, as we struggled with, if we went back to that chart to show the decline in not only um, inflation adjusted general fund revenue, but but uh, but uh, you know actual general fund revenue. Um, we, were, we were kind of hemorrhaging revenue at the time. Um, and uh, the legislature at that time, uh, decided that this would be one way to help mitigate those budget uh, those budget challenges, um, and I think those who were supportive of it, um, you know, deemed it that uh, you know our cash assistance program was too big. I think some thought that, others disagreed, um, but certainly the the money and the no, the budget numbers um, helped drive those conversations because the state was looking at how can we how can we cut. Um, and, and live within, you know, our decreasing means at that time. Um, and now this is federal money coming in in TANF. But what, when, when those cuts to cash assistance were made, that TANF was then used, moved to other places in the budget, like for instance, college scholarships. And the general fund that had supported those scholarships went down and helped us address our our budget challenges at that time. So I, I don't want to suggest that it was completely money, um, but money was certainly a driving factor. I've got a question here going back to the uh, pre-funding of uh, OPEB and using that $632 million as a revenue stream. Let's, let's just presume that the legislature signs off on that. How far or how long then would it take to pre-fund the retiree health care and the OPEB past 2038 if we went and did that because uh if we didn't we were on track to pre-fund by 2038 but if we do it seems like it would take much longer are there any projections on that yeah this is craig um the, 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 from what we see in the most recent actuarial report um again uh, uh it, it, and it was for the period ended the end of uh, 2022 um, and then projecting forward uh, the, the retiree health component is expected to be fully funded um, so that's all subject to the assumptions between 2022 and 2025 bearing out so that would be assumptions related to the investment uh, the portfolios investment performance, uh, you know, contributions from employers, which are largely tied to the, the payroll base, all of those things, um, uh, you know, bearing out um, would result in the uh, retiree health component being fully funded and wouldn't require any uh, debt payments. Um, the pension piece, which is uh, on a, a, a separate schedule, um, is on path to, to, to be fully paid by 2038. Um, again, assuming that all the assumptions bear out. Um, so the state is putting in the, the necessary uh, resources to pay off that debt uh, by 2038. Uh, I don't think that extending it, that this uh, proposal would extend the payoff of the pension piece beyond 2038 at all. Um, so, but the, but Craig, then what, what's the downside to not using the money then? If OPEB is already taken care of and the pension is on a separate track, then why not just use the money? Well, the, the money certainly could be used. It's programmed in the budget right now for debt payments and the, the debt is paid off. The question is, the statutory requirement that speaks to the funding floor, which again is a, uh, a dollar amount uh, uh, in total 
for both pension and retiree health. Uh, some have interpreted that floor to suggest that the resources that aren't needed to pay off the, the retiree health should then be redirected to, to expedite, to speed up the funding, full funding of the pension. Um, so in that scenario, the resources would be shifted to as a uh, pension uh, debt payment, um, which would shave off the period of of paying off those pension debts from 2038 to something sooner um, in, a, in an effect, uh, you know, saving on the, the interest costs uh, that we uh, are projected to have to spend to pay it off by 2038, Kyle. Oh, okay, I get it. So we're not, we're not putting the state backwards by using that money, but by, by, uh, by not using that money, or we could maybe speed up the process of the pre-funding of the, uh, the pension. Okay, I get it, thank you. I wanna ask about the rainy day fund. Uh, well, for Michigan itself, it's at a record high. Do you know how Michigan compares to other states in terms of how much money it has in its rainy day fund? I, I, I have not looked at numbers recently. Um, I think all states, you know, Michigan, it wasn't unique among states and getting a lot of seeing more revenue growth that we expected, you know, cutting budgets at the beginning of COVID, but then realizing we're getting more revenue. So I would think all states have probably or the vast majority have increased their rainy day, uh, 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 their rainy day fund balances and their just regular standing fund balances. Um, I, I, I think we're probably a little ahead of uh, of the game relative to the average state. Um, I say that cautiously because I'm kind of doing that from uh, uh, you know from stuff I looked at maybe a, a year or two back. Um, that's a good question and one we should probably dig into uh, to see what recent uh, analyses of state rainy day fund balances are. There are entities out there that, that report on that regularly, but we are doing, we're doing pretty well, both in terms of our level and in terms of that coverage, as we called it, you know, what, what percent of our overall, uh, our overall, um, uh, balance is covered by our rainy day fund. One, one just quick thing, Michigan is unique in that we have the school aid fund as a separate major fund for many states especially those that have that cover a lot of k-12 costs uh, from state revenue those would all be lumped into their general fund so if you want to compare michigan to other states it's really you need to do what we did which is look at the school aid and general fund together and, and for mo and compare that against for what most states would be their gen you know what what percentage of rainy day fund to their general fund balance because in most states that's going to include what they're providing to uh to, to k-12 schools um I have a quick follow up. I mean, so what percentage of this budget is dedicated to the omnibus rainy day fund? Uh, a very small, if you mean like what percentage of, it's a hundred million dollars um, that's proposed out of the, out of the 25 fiscal year 2025 general fund. Um, will instead of being appropriated in the budget for something else, it will be sent to the rainy day fund. The total general fund is much larger than that. So it's a, it's a pretty small, less than 1% of the overall general fund. Um, but it's, you know, it, it does get that balance that we've already accrued um, up to, uh, you know, expected to be about $2.2 .2 billion. We've had very healthy, uh, interest and uh you know re returns on on that cash that we have in our in our major balances as well um both the extra 100 million and all those interest earnings are going to help push it up to 2.2 billion yeah but that itself is record breaking though right there's been larger portions of budgets dedicated to rainy day funds in michigan before right yeah i think that's fair to say i don't think um dramatically more um, I'm trying to, you know, I'm sure there's a budget where we've put uh, two or 300 million in, and those were smaller general funds at the time um, in order to help us uh, boost up that, uh, boost up that rainy day fund uh, more quickly. Um, I, you know, I, I would say we, 
we are uh, pretty close to where we need to be with the, with the, with the rainy day fund. Um, so I, I think it's a good idea that that that, uh, uh, that that some that more was put in to continue to push up that balance, um, and it, we're probably in pretty decent shape going forward. Let's make this the last question. All right. Um, one of our uh, listeners wanted to ask about this uh, community college guarantee. And Craig, we talked about the sustainability of this budget long term. But if we were to push forward and uh, basically open up the uh, the doors for folks to, to go to community college on the state's dime, is that contingent then on this OPEB fund shift or is it possible they could find another way or some other revenue to make this thing happen? Yeah, this is Bob. So I, I'm going to take a, a whack at that one. Since I, it was uh, that was part of the budget that I that I looked at, and Craig can certainly um, can certainly add feedback too if you want. So that that community college um, you know enhancement to the achievement scholarships was not tied to the MIPSers, you know, and in fact, um, it's general fund revenue that would be going into uh, that would be going into enhanced uh, achievement scholarship fund. So we'll see. I'm going to. I think people can still see my screen. I may go back to that slide. Uh, so we have been appropriating. Basically, we are accruing a balance in a, in the achievement scholarship fund. Those that purple appropriation, the purple uh, sections of these bars are the appropriations we've made into the achievement scholarships. Uh, it was about 250 million in, in fiscal year 23, 300 million in 24. The governor's proposed 330 in 25. But remember, we have not. We are just starting to draw on that money because this class, the of uh, high school graduates um, that entered college, either community college, or universities, and in 23 are the first recipients of this uh, of this money. So we have a little bit of a bank of of money available right now. What will what will have to be watched is how much, how quickly this starts to get drawn. I think we have enough, more than enough right now to get through this year. And the question will be with this new community college commitment, um, that's going to push up how uh, the draw on this money. And we're going to need to determine over time. This will, I guess I would say this will continue to be a budget pressure because we're going to need to continue to boost that $330 million in 25 that's ongoing. It's probably going to need to go up over time as we get uh, a, a second uh, cohort of students and a third and a fourth at the four years that are going to be drawing on the achievement scholarship. So that um, that purple bar will continue to go up over time. It will be a budget pressure um, that will continue to need to draw on available revenue growth. Um, I hope that made sense. Kyle, let me know if you want any clarification on that. And it doesn't have, it's not tied into the MIPSERS fund shift. Got it. Thank you very much for that, Bob. Yep. So let that conclude our session today. Thank you all for those who hung on to the end. Uh, we did, in fact, record this, and it takes about half an hour to process it and load it to our YouTube channel. It'll be on the events page on our website. If you have any questions uh, that weren't asked there, we're going to try to follow up on those that were posed during the session. If you have others, feel free to email us. Uh, you can contact us on the About Us part of our website. And um, watch for further information. Again, I encourage you to add your name to the list to be part of our email distribution and follow us on social media. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day.